All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Dornsife Discover program today. We are so excited to have you join us as we explore the social sciences and the humanities fields at USC. My name is Jess Castaldi, and I am an assistant director here in the Dornsife Office of Admission and Student Success. Um, again, we're so happy to be hosting you today so that you can learn a little bit more about what it means to study the social sciences and the humanities in Dornsife. We have four great current Dornsife students um, who are here today. They're going to share their experiences and their stories with you. Um, but before we introduce them and jump into the conversation with them, I have a few brief logistics to cover. This is a Zoom webinar, so you will have a chance to ask our student panelists some questions um, towards the end of the hour that we have together. So I want you to look for the Q&A box at the bottom of the window. That's where you're gonna be able to, to ask your, your questions to the students. Um, but we do ask that you hold off on using that Q&A function um, until I indicate that we're ready for the Q&A. It'll be in about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions. Um, I also have a few other Dornsife staff members um, here in the Zoom, Zoom webinar with me. Um, so they're gonna be answering your questions um, behind, the, behind the scenes. So I'd like to have them quickly turn on their cameras um, and give a little hello. We have a really awesome team here in the Dornsife admission office and we will do our very best to make sure you get all of your questions answered. Uh, thank you so much to the team. Um, and now I would like to ask our student panelists to turn on their cameras um, so that they can introduce themselves. So we're going to go, we're going to start with Jane. Um, actually, no, we'll start with, with Jack, I think. Thanks, Jess. Uh, my name is Jack Casey. I am a senior um, from the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a double major in history and Latin American and Iberian cultures, media and politics. Um, and I'm in, um, or engaged here um, as a research assistant here at USC, as well as um, I'm in Dornsife Ambassadors. Um, I worked as a resident assistant, and then I um, am planning on um, applying to PhD programs in history or um, Fulbright. Hi, I'm Jane. I am a senior at USC. Uh, my hometown is Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a double major in economics and international relations, and I also have a minor in East Asian languages and cultures. I'm on campus. I'm a Dornsife ambassador. I'm also part of Hawaii Club, and I'm a remote mentor for Scholars Leading Scholars, which is part of Trojan Scholar Society here on campus. And Post-grad, I really wanted to engage in analytical and creative problem-solving skills, so I'll actually be working as a risk consulting associate in the health industries with a large accounting firm post-grad. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Aoki. I'm a senior from Orange County, California. I study law, history, and culture with a minor in Middle East studies. And I, aside from being a Dornsife ambassador, I'm involved as an UNRU associate at the USC Center for the Political Future. I like to attend a lot of Hillel events and I'm a former resident assistant. One career goal of mine is to attend law school and hopefully work in the public interest field of law. Hi everyone, my name is Kat Birkenfeld and I'm a junior here at USC from Peoria, Arizona. Um, I'm double majoring in non-government organizations and social change and psychology with a minor in social work and juvenile justice. And I'm applying into our master's in social work progressive degree program right now. Um, aside from Dornsife Ambassadors, I'm an intern for the Post-Conviction Justice Project here at the School of Law. Um, I'm the director of Words Uncaged um, at USC, and I'm also a counselor for USC's Troy Camp. And post-grad, I hope to practice as a clinical social worker with youth who are gang involved or in the incarceration system. Awesome. Thank you so much to our student panel. They are going to be great. Um, and before we jump into hearing about their experiences, which is what I think is going to make this session really valuable to, to the audience here, um, I do want to run through really quickly what to expect over the next 50 minutes or so. First, I'm going to give a brief overview of the Dornsife College, who we are, um, what we consist of, then I'm gonna go through curriculum, which is essentially all the classes that you're going to have to take um, in, in Dornsife and throughout USC in order to graduate with your bachelor's. 
Then I'm going to talk about experiential learning. Um, and those are the different opportunities that you are going to pursue where you can apply what you're learning in your classes in the real world. Things like research, study abroad, service learning, um, internships. Then the, the last part, we'll wrap things up. We'll talk about support. We'll talk about academic advising, the different resources that you have at your disposal so that you can do you know, the best job that you can possibly um, do while you're an undergraduate student here at USC. Um, and after that, we'll open it up for, for Q&A. So to start with the, the very first part of what I just said, um, we'll go through a really brief overview of what the Dornsife College is. Um, we are essentially the liberal arts college within the greater um, kind of community of the, U the University of Southern California. USC consists of 15 undergraduate schools, and we are one of those 15 schools. We are the largest in terms of number of programs and in terms of population. So we're over 35% of the undergraduate student population, and that's about 7,000 students. So we're a nice, healthy part of the USC community. We have over 90 majors and 90 minors that span the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. And today we're gonna to be talking about the social sciences and the humanities portion um, of our majors and minors. So our students really want that kind of interdisciplinary type of education, a way of learning about a multitude of different topics and concepts from a multitude of different perspectives and lenses in order to become kind of more holistic people and holistic learners. Um, and as a liberal arts school, that is really our focus. Our focus is on educating you as a whole person, having a holistic approach to education. And we also want you to be able to develop foundational um, transferable skills. So things like critical thinking, analysis, being able to creatively problem solve, um, communicate, take initiative and be proactive on different projects, being able to collaborate with a diverse set of um, group of people. So these are types of skills that you're going to develop in a liberal arts curriculum. And we know that you're going to need them no matter what you decide to do at USC or after USC, no matter what career you choose or what industry that career is in or how many times you change careers or industries. Um, we also know that a lot of our students Storm Safe students specifically, truly want to make an impact on their communities. Um, and through our curriculum and the education experience that you'll get at USC Dorn Safe, you're going to develop the tools to make those changes and make those impacts, whether it's on a micro or macro level. So that's a little bit about us, a little bit about Dorn Safe. Um, I'll jump now into kind of the curriculum portion um, of our session today. And just for context, when we're talking about the different classes that you have to take at USC, we like to group them or, or talk about them as if there's a pie chart and it's divided into thirds. A third of your classes are going to be general education courses. We also call those courses the USC core or GEs for short. I think we're going to stick with GEs just for the sake of, of ease. Um, so GEs are nice. A third of the classes that you'll be taking, a third of your classes will be your major. And then a third of your classes will be your electives, roughly speaking. So first, we're going to talk about your general education or the GE classes. Um, and just to give kind of a, a brief overview, I kind of want to turn to Jack so that he can talk a little bit about the GEs, how they're structured at USC, um, and how he's found them valuable. Thank you. Yeah. So um, the way that the GEs are set up is that you have uh, general education requirements in different um, or disciplines, even outside where your major is. So there's a life science requirement. There is a physical science requirement. So, for example, um, I was able to take an astronomy course um, for one of my GEs uh, that was actually ended up being one of my favorite classes, even though it's wildly outside of, you know, where my majors are. Um, but then also um, your freshman year is typically characterized by your um, general education seminar or your um, writing 150 course, um, which are just right introductory uh, courses to writing or general education seminars can range from so many different topics. Mine, for example, was um, like memory and trauma and Latin American and Spanish cinema. But then, um, you know, other people have taken, you know, very different um, seminars as well. And then a lot of people actually take seminars that are in topics outside of where they're at. So that's been my experience with GEs of that actually uh, it's widened my perspective beyond just what 
um, I thought that I wanted to do. Of I was really interested in history, but my GE courses opened me into film studies, into visual culture, into material culture. And um, now in my senior year, um, I just have a much broader perspective about the things that I'm interested in. Awesome. And then did you take your GEs like towards the beginning of your time at USC? Did you spread them out? I know sometimes students have questions on when students take their general education courses. Yeah, I decided to more front load mine and then I'd come in with AP credit that had satisfied some of the other requirements. So I decided that I wanted to wrap those up and then, um, you know, end my last semesters with uh, courses that I was, you know, that were more focused in my major, some more uh, up or like uh, uh, higher level courses like seminars and um, thesis classes. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, I know all four of the students have experience with GEs, um, but I'm going to just ask one more student to share their experience. Gabrielle, what's your experience been with the GEs thus far? Yeah, so like Jack said, the GEs were a great experience for myself just in terms of coming into contact with subjects that I otherwise wouldn't interact with. And I similarly front loaded mine and I was able to wrap up the GE requirements around the end of my sophomore year. So I got to take classes that in some cases would count towards my majors and other classes they would be something completely different. Like I also took the astronomy course. So I appreciated them in that they were able to uh, acclimate me to the college pace of just learning while being in a safe zone at a relatively introductory level. Yeah, and just for the, again, for the audience, all students at USC have to fulfill the same general education um, categories in order to, to be cleared for graduation. So when you're looking at the, lists of classes that'll satisfy general education courses or requirements, you're gonna be taking those classes with students from all over the university, from engineering to dance, to business, to all the different majors within Dorn Scythe. So it is also a really great way to get to know students from, from different parts of the university. Um, the next area that I'm gonna talk about um, when you're thinking about that pie chart are, are the majors. Um, so all of these students have really interesting major and double major and minor combinations. So in also talking about the majors, that, that other third, we can also talk about the last third, which is your electives. Um, and your electives can be used in a lot of different ways. Primarily what students do is that they streamline their electives into a second or second and third um, subject area. So a lot of students see, well, I have my GEs as one third, I have my major as a second third, but I have a whole third of classes that I can do a lot with. I can do whatever I want for the most part with. So a lot of students will see that extra third and that's how they'll decide on a second major or a minor or a major and a minor. It really depends on what you're interested in. Um, so at this point, I want to ask all four of the students um, because they're all studying very different things within the social sciences and humanities. Um, to elaborate on their major, majors, minors, the combination that they've, they've kind of come up with for themselves. Um, so we'll start with Jack again. Yeah, so um, I initially came in as a history major, and then um, I knew that I wanted to add a Spanish uh, double major, but then it actually was after I um, had taken a course my first semester that I found out about the Latin American and Iberian cultures, media and politics major, which is an interdisciplinary major in the department and what it does is it actually combines courses from um, like art history, history, political science, international relations, economics, but you're really allowed to shape it in the way that you want to. So I focus more on like visual culture and literature and um, it's actually had just uh, a huge impact on the intersections that I see between like history and Latin American and Iberian studies. Um, and that's really come out in my senior thesis that I'm currently finishing right now of uh, it's interdisciplinary and in that I'm looking at both like visual sources as well as like written sources to um, write my thesis and to look at, you know, silences and absences in the historical archive. Uh, and I'm very uh, happy with my decision to um, double major with that because it opened up the ability to take a bunch of courses that were outside of my typical department, um, but they still counted for my major. And then Jane and Gabrielle and then Yeah, so I came in to USC with an economics major, but I all, always knew that I wanted to add an international relations major as well. I had taken an economics course in high school, fell in love with the, how 
fell in love with how society and economics work together. And then I had the opportunity in high school to also study abroad or like volunteer abroad. And that helped me realize that I liked seeing economics in a more global context. So within the first month of me arriving at USC, I added the international relations major and I opted to um, create an inter to do an international relations and economics double major versus like some of the more interdisciplinary international relations majors offered because I wanted to have a deep skill set and a lot of coursework in both. And I also added a minor in East Asian languages and cultures, but I did not do that until I'd say my junior year. I was initially planning on studying abroad um, in London but for the entire school year, but because of COVID that ended up not happening and I had an extra semester um, free to kind of do whatever I wanted. And it was either graduate early or add a minor. And I decided why not add a minor? I've been studying Japanese language for basically all of my life. And it'd be cool to dive in and explore that more. Hi, so as a law, history, and culture major, I was drawn to this, and I'll use LHC just because it's easier. Um, but yeah, I was drawn to the subject of history all throughout high school. My AP World History class and my AP US History class were both really enriching. So I knew that I wanted to stay within that broad field of study, but I came to USC and I met another LHC major and realized that certain courses that while not directly within the history department were tangentially related could count under the LHC major. So I switched within my first month and that entailed emailing my academic advisor and having my academic record be adjusted within I think a week's turnaround. And what really drew me to the major was the idea that I could experiment with different subjects and see how they interacted with one another. Even now I'm taking a political science and social reform class that's interacting perfectly with a class that's, while not in my major, it's in my minor, the global Middle East. And, you know, reading Foucault, getting to see the connection of these studies um, all through subjects that I just were drawn to quite randomly just by being exposed to in class. Um, I've been able to kind of draw my own conclusions and go about history as I chose. So it's a great sense of autonomy that I can get while learning. Hi, so for me, I came in as a psychology major. I was on the pre-occupational therapy track and things change sometimes, but I kept psych because I absolutely love it. I love learning about why humans make certain decisions, why we act the way that we do. I think it just augments your empathy times a thousand and you learn so much about just the brain and how we function. So I've kept psychology with me. Um, NGOs, I actually didn't know that the NGOs and social change major existed, um, but I took this class that was actually just gonna be an elective. It had nothing to do with what at the time I thought I would wanna do. Um, it was called Theater in the Community. We partnered with a public policy class and two men who had served um, life sentences were formerly incarcerated and had gotten their sentences commuted. And we did a show on restorative justice and the plights of mass incarceration. And after that, I was like, how can I not do this for the rest of my life? And I was like, oh my God, there's a major where I can actually be studying these issues. Um, so the NGOs major, I can't rave about it enough. It's very interdisciplinary and I have not looked back ever since. Um, and then my minor, I actually took a course for the NGOs and social change major called Adolescent Gang Intervention. And that class is part of a brand new minor that um, just was spearheaded. It's called Social Work and Juvenile Justice. It's in the School of Social Work. Um, and once I took that course, it was kind of that moment again where I was like, oh my God, there's a minor for this topic that I love. Um, and it's brand new and has four classes all in that realm. Um, so I picked that up as soon as I took that class as well. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, and just because I know three out of four of you are double majoring and also three out of four of you have interdisciplinary majors, I'm gonna ask Kat and Jack to talk a little bit more. I mean, Kat, you'll talk about NGOs and social change. Jack, you'll talk about your major has a really long title, Latin American and Iberian cultures, media and politics. I think I got it right. Um, but if you could talk a little bit more about the interdisciplinary nature of those majors, and also in your answer, if you can talk about, I know the audience is always curious, like 
is it more work having a double major? How do you go about declaring a double major? That sort of thing. Um, and we'll start with Jack. Yeah, so, um, or my major, the way that it differs from the regular Spanish major is Spanish as a major is focused more on like literature. Um, and studying the mechanics of the language, whereas then like, which is the abbreviation that we have for that very, very long name for that um, uh, major, is uh, is more geared towards the intersection of like art history and history and politics and, and economics in Latin America and thinking about that through media and culture. So um, the courses that I was able to take through that um, included like arts of Latin America, Afro Latin America, modern Latin America, um, history in the museum, courses that were looking really at this uh, relationship between visual culture and written culture, which is, uh, and I think that it's malleable and that you can get what you want out of it. You're able to choose whatever courses that you want to take to include in that major. Um, and the process to do it was very, um, or was very easy of, I just uh, sat down with my academic advisor for that major. You have a different advisor for a different major, well, depending on what department they're in. So um, like is in a different department than history. So I had an advisor for both. And um, every time that I was making a course plan to make sure that I was graduating on time, they I would sit down with both of them and get approval about the courses that I was taking um, and that they would um, keep me on track then to graduate on time. Yeah, so for NGOs and social change, um, what I've loved about it is how interdisciplinary it is. So it's not like psychology, where like if you're majoring in psychology, you take classes in the psychology department. It's just kind of all over Dorn's life. So I'm taking things like classes in political science, in social work, in theater, like you name it, it's all over the place, which has been really fun because I kind of get to view these issues I'm really passionate about, but in like a ton of different ways. Um, and it's also really cool because you can kind of either niche the NGOs major to like if you know you really care about certain issues or certain like nonprofit sectors, you can kind of like take classes that focus on those, or you can be all over the place and get a ton of different worldviews and go wherever you want to go with it. Um, so that's been really cool because I've kind of gotten to do both. I, I know what I love, so I've taken a lot of courses in those subjects, but then I've also taken ones that are a bit more far out and like have actually created new passions for me, which is really cool. Um, regarding if it's more work, I mean, definitely, I think just knowing that one major versus two majors, it's going to be more work. But for me, like, I feel so much more well-rounded and I love the ways that like everything I'm learning in psychology pertains so much to all of this NGO stuff and vice versa. And so I love seeing that intersection and to me, like doing a little more work is worth it. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely going to be more work, but I think it's definitely manageable, particularly like I know NGOs is a bit of a smaller major in comparison to like psychology, so they balance out well. Um, and yeah, like Jack said, I just reached out to the advisor and because it was within Dorn's life still, it was really easy to add it on. Um, it does get a little more complex if you apply to majors that are outside of the school that you're in. Um, that's more of an application process and is dependent upon the school. But for Dorn's life, it's really easy to just reach out to advisors and add on any majors or minors you want. Um, thank you. It's a really great segue into kind of, I mean, all these, most of these students have kind of stuck with the major that they applied with and were and were accepted with and then added on programs um, but obviously you can also change the major that you were admitted to you have about um about three to four semesters so by the end of your sophomore year you really should have solidified the major or major combinations that you'd like to pursue for the rest of your time at USC but by no means are you contractually obligated to fulfill the major that you choose on the common application, especially because you're going to take a lot of classes in the first couple semesters that may really broaden, broaden your horizons. You may learn about certain subjects that you weren't exposed to before and decide to change your major. Um, it's it's a, a simple process, especially if you're moving within Dorrance Life. Um, and I really want Gabrielle to talk a little bit about her process in that. Hi. So 
Yeah, as I said before, I was always in love with the history subject, um, just as it stood as a form of learning. For me, it's like an enriched way of storytelling. So I came into class and I was able to talk to other students, other students within the history department. And I just found that there were students who could take classes outside of the history department. And that was attractive to me in that I could really find a way again, to sort of weave um, my own studies and also experiment with new subjects that wouldn't otherwise count for my major. And since having changed uh, my major, I've been able to kind of gain more flexibility in the courses that I choose. And that includes seeing courses that while at first glance, it may seem like they don't connect, I could petition be a, a short waiver and a meeting with my academic advisor. And suddenly, you know, a class within the classics department, like I think it was democracy in ancient Greece, that's incorporated into my field of study. So as someone who enjoys history on a sort of macro level or as a generalist, this major has really allowed me to experience different subjects and kind of gain an understanding for um, just for history as it involves other subjects as well. It takes initiative, but it's so rewarding to be in a class that you found on your own and you were able to apply to your field of study. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. And apologies if my mic is doing some strange things. It's just technology working through it. Um, but on that note, I want Kat to talk a little bit about her minor, which is actually in a school outside of Dornsife, because you can add minors and majors that are outside of Dornsife, where your initial major is housed. Um, and Kat already mentioned that it might entail like an additional application um, or something of that nature. So Kat, if you can talk about uh, talk about your minor, um, and then and then we'll also get into another subject that you can tell us a little bit about. Yeah, yeah. So like I said, I enrolled in a class for NGOs called Adolescent Gang Intervention, and the professor who taught it is one of my mentors here at USC, and he was spearheading a brand new minor um, in social work and juvenile justice. And it's in the School of Social Work, which is really cool because that's a graduate school. So the fact that they are starting to offer undergraduate classes, like um, even more than they, I think they've been doing like one or two before. Um, but now we can do a whole minor in the school. It was really exciting. And also through this minor, um, it is kind of like it pre-qualifies you to apply into the progressive degree program here, which we'll speak about a little bit later, I believe. Um, but yeah, and so for me, I didn't have to do um, a big application process process per se. I just had to meet with my advisors, get their signature, and reach out to um, my professor and the other person spearheading the minor and just like sign it and everything. Um, so that was a pretty easy process. For other schools, like I know when I first came into USC, I wanted to apply into the journalism school and do a double major in journalism. And when I was looking into that, um, I was going to have to, I was taking a few like entry level journalism classes just to make sure it was what I wanted. And then I was going to apply the next year. Um, and that was a whole separate application process. Um, so it was just like if you were going to apply um, into a, a school, you had to do that again for the other major. Uh, I didn't end up falling through with that. Um, and luckily my minor was a bit easier, but it kind of just depends on what you want to add on. Um, but definitely not a difficult process. Your advisors and faculty are always there to walk you through it and however you need it. And I'm actually like really happy with my minor. It's been really, really interesting. And it is outside of Dornsife, but still really highly connected to a lot of things. So it's been a really amazing process. Awesome. And can just kind of rounding out our, our curriculum um, portion here, can you tell us a little bit about the progressive degree program um, that you've recently ap applied to? And maybe for the sake of the audience, explain what a progressive master's degree is at USC. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a progressive degree program is basically when you can apply into a USC master's program during your undergraduate. And then if you have like open spaces per se, like elective credits or, or just like extra space in your schedule, you can start taking classes towards your master's degree while you're an undergrad. And then once you do go into your usually like fifth year um, and get your full master's, or like I know for me, the master's in social work program that I'm applying into, I have to do two years of field work that's government mandated. So I'll be here for two years. 
Um, but yeah, so most people can get it done in like five years total. So like four years of undergrad, one year of graduate, but it just depends on the program. Like I said, mine's a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so it's really, really cool because you can be taking graduate level courses while you're an undergrad and also get it done a lot faster. Um, and I know like for me, like I said earlier, the minor in social work and juvenile justice, those units are technically counting to take off some of the courses I would need for my master's, which is really cool because they're not technically graduate level courses, but I am knocking out some units with them. Um, so yeah, and I'm on track to hopefully if I get in, everything goes well, um, take my first graduate course next year and then be in the program for the next two years. So it's a really awesome program and you can get it done so much faster. And yeah, I definitely recommend it. Awesome, thank you so much. I also put a link in the chat so that you can learn more about the programs that we have at USC and in Dornsife. Um, there are a multitude of them for people with different interests. Um, so that is kind of concludes our time talking about inside the classroom experiences, um, about your curriculum. So now we're gonna move on to experiential learning. And this is how you're going to apply the knowledge that you're learning in the classroom, in the field, in the real world. Um, and I mentioned these kind of four areas before, the four areas that we find that our students pursue their academic passions outside the classroom are in research, study abroad, internships, and service learning, which service learning, what that means to us is applying what you're learning in a service oriented way. So applying what you might be learning in a class at USC in another classroom, in another school, typically an elementary or secondary school in the US in the USC area. Um, so to start us off with talking about how um, they've been able to apply what they're learning in a real world sense, I want to start with research, which again, kind of um, in, in our world of defining research is having a question and then trying to find the answer to that question. So it doesn't mean that you have to be in a lab with a white coat and a microscope and pipettes trying to find an answer to a particular reason, you can be doing research in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, so I'd like to start with Jack um, so that he can tell us about his research because I know you've done quite a bit of humanities research at USC um, and beyond. Yeah, so um, or I'll give you a little bit of a, a journey on how I started research, because um, that's also one of the biggest questions that we get is like, how do you start? So um, I started my second semester of freshman year um, working as a research assistant for Professor Perez Morales in the history department. Um, and uh, or after I took the class with him and was really interested in the work that he was doing, I just um, met with him in office hours and um, asked if I could do research with him. And um, I started working as a research assistant. Then I started working with Professor Daniela Blykmar, who's cross-listed in the history and art history departments. And I've been working with her on her research. And through that, I was able to start to understand the process of how do you, you ask your own questions that you're interested in. And because I was interested in their research, they gave me book recommendations and told me about their own research and where I could go looking for these questions. And um, uh, I was able then to uh, acquire a lot of resources through USC to fund that research. So um, being a, a paid research assistant is something that I've done for the past three years um, that I have gotten through my, through my work study. Um, and then I also have been able to um, get summer grants um, like the uh, summer or like it's called the SURE grant, the Summer Humanities Undergraduate Research Experience. Um, we're a huge fan of acronyms here. Um, that was able to fund my research this summer to Spain, where I was in an archive um, in Sevilla for about a week. Um, I was in Spain for a month, but I was there for a week in the archives doing research and all of those primary sources that I was looking at there are now um, or are in my senior thesis. Um, and hopefully um, I will be going to grad school. So that archival research experience is really important for the career plans that I have. Um, so uh, really, the main things that you need to know about research in the humanities, especially at USC, is that it's available and accessible. All you need to do is really ask for it. And also that there is um, an abundance of funding available. I think it's a misconception that people think that the, or that the humanities are like underfunded in terms of research. It just means that the research looks different. Um, like just said, it's not like a white, white coat and pipette kind of thing, but more of like archival research, field work, um, those kinds of things. So uh, just know that uh, USC fully supports that. Awesome. And Jane, I know you have start have a brief um, experience with research as well. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so I, um, my research is a little bit more untraditional because I, instead of working with a professor, 
on campus here at USC, I actually work with the World Bank as a research assistant. So I've been working with the World Bank's team in Europe and Central Asia regarding sustainable development and um, coming up with disaster risk management uh, solutions and prevention measures for the European Commission. And I actually found this opportunity through my Maymaster professor. So here at USC, we have this course called Maymaster that you can register for with your spring semester course load. My May master was supposed to be in Leuven, Belgium, but unfortunately, given the COVID-19 pandemic, it shifted to an online format, but it was still an informative experience where I was able to learn from, um, learn from practitioners from the World Bank and the IMF. I was supposed to learn, I was able to learn from professors from KU Leuven and other universities. And my professor had this cool opportunity that he emailed us about. And from there, I, I applied and I was able to get it and I was able to use the skills that I learned through my May master, such as gathering data from the European Commission's like website that houses all the data and everything. And I was able to, you know, take those skills and really apply it to that position. I started in August 2020 and I'm still doing it to this day. Awesome. Thanks, Jane. Um, and so like the students have kind of elucidated, it, you can real anyone can do research, you really just have to be proactive and take initiative in order to find it. And you might have to ask, go through kind of several different people, go through a shuffle in order to kind of get to your ultimate destination. Um, the next area that we're going to talk about within experiential learning is study abroad. So that is an a kind of opportunity and activity, a, a experience that a lot of our students have not been able to have um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have been able to have some virtual programs that Jane mentioned. Hopefully next semester, next summer, a lot of these programs are going to come back full force. Um, but we do have a domestic study abroad program that Gabrielle was able to take part in last spring. So I want to give her an opportunity to talk about um, to talk about her experience with with this particular program. Yeah, so like Jess said, I was pretty upset at the turnout of study abroad, and I did a quick browse on the experiential learning webpage just to see if there was any experience I could get virtual or otherwise. And I came across the Dornsife in DC program. And as someone who's always been interested in the field of politics, just as a consumer and also for a potential career post-grad, I was drawn to the program and the process was going to an information session, a short written application, an interview, and after having been accepted, 18 or so USC students were, were traveled out to DC. We got local residents and we were able to take a full-time internship, uh, whether that be found independently or through coordination with a professor. I'll speak on that a little bit later. And yeah, we got to have just a localized travel experience. Um, you know, it was the first time for me that I had a full-time internship to begin with and one that was remote. So there was a lot of new things going on and I was always grounded in the, my peers basically and my teachers. You had a really strong social network you could draw from. And I was able to work at the Campaign Legal Center, which is a legal advocacy group that studies uh, campaign finance, ethics, redistricting, and voting rights issues. And you know, it's one thing to learn about the history of voting rights in the US in a classroom. And it's another thing to really apply that to the professional field. I was able to draft advocacy toolkits, press clippings, um, you know, public statements, action alerts, and conduct legal research. So for me, it was really the merger of academics and the professional world. Navigating that with my peers who are in a similar situation was really great. And it was all under the guidance of a professor who traveled with us to, the, to DC. And the class, I believe, is called International Relations 391. They have an equivalent class within the political science department, but it's a class where you take an internship as well as a course and you get to write a sort of reflection paper at the end to see the culmination of that experience. So it was just insanely unique to be in the nation's capital at such an important time and really experience that with fellow USC students overall. And I think a common thread through kind of listening to you explain what Dornsife DC is and that it's a combination of a study abroad program with an internship. 
um, and how Jane was mentioning Maymesser, which is to typically a study abroad experience, either domestic, domestically or internationally, that has a research component to it. So a lot of times we like to kind of combine these different experiential opportunities to accomplish one or two or more um, of the different kind of four categories that I've mentioned. Um, so Gabrielle talking about her internship in DC or remotely brings me to the next section, which is internships. I know that Jane has been able to experience a couple. Um, so if you could briefly talk about your experience um, in getting some of those and, and what you've learned from those experiences. Yeah, of course. So I found internships to be really useful for um, helping me understand what I wanted to do post um, grad. And I think it'll be the most logical to go in chronological order and I can indicate whether or not I was able to receive this opportunity through USC or not, um, or through other means. So I'll um, get started. So um, in summer 2020, I was able to intern as a policy research intern at the Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. And that was something I was able to find on my own just while I was home during COVID. And it was an unpaid internship, but USC does offer resources and funding to help offset the costs that can come from unpaid internships to help make sure that, you know, you're able to, um, you're just able to live off of the work and you're able to be compensated fairly um, through some type of means. Um, after that, um, in fall 2020, I engaged in a semester long um, internship that I actually received through the study abroad office where I worked with an international public policy firm on their efforts for coal divestment. Uh, so, and this firm was based in Sydney, Australia. So it was really cool to have that international experience working with colleagues in Australia, in London, um, also in California, and I was at back home in Hawaii. So definitely allowed me to hone my um, hone my teamwork skill teamwork skills, especially along cultural lines and time zones. And I was able to learn a lot through that internship. Really helped me understand my interest in sustainable development and the environment. I was able to work on. I was able to work on coming up with campaign strategies to help encourage insurance um, insurance companies that were multinational to divest in coal projects. And I was also able to work on a report where I was able to have that published and have that under my belt as something I've done. Um, I've also worked in finance at the World Bank uh, Treasury and that I was able to kind of get my start in my introduction in world to the World Bank through my May master course. And I worked in finance, realized I moved out to Washington DC actually this summer, worked in finance, realized I didn't like it. And kind of that's how I was able to realize that I wanted to be in consulting and that's where I am post-grad and I'm super happy about it. Awesome, thank you. And congratulations on, on getting a job offer. Um, so the last kind of area um, that we're going to talk about in terms of experiential learning is service learning. And like I mentioned before, that's just having an opportunity to teach something that you're learning um, in a different environment. So I know Jack um, has been involved in service learning. So if you could briefly tell us about your experience with that, and then we will move on to the last, um, last area before opening it up for questions. Yeah, so um, the way that most Dornside students participate in experiential learning is through the Joint Education Project, which is a um, organization that here that we have on campus that um, organizes service learning opportunities. So the ways that I participated were um, I worked as a reading and math tutor um, in a local elementary school for about a year. And then also through a lot of language courses, you actually are able to apply what you're learning um, in the classrooms. Um, so specifically, I went into um, a local school and worked with high school students on um, writing bilingual essays about metamorphosis. I have had friends that have, have taken like French and Italian courses that have gone in then and helped other students in other schools around USC. Um, so really just taking the, you know, the languages that you're learning um, and using that knowledge and applying it then in other instances. It's not just language courses, but also science education courses that um, people are engaging with the community in. 
Awesome, thank you. And I'm sure if anyone has questions about service learning, you can always ask them in the chat. Um, so at this time, we are gonna open the Q&A. So right now is when you can start typing in your questions. Um, so please use the box, not like the actual chat function, function. use the, the Q&A box. Um, so we will take some questions live and then others will be answered by the members that you that you saw wave earlier, the members of the Dorn Fife Admission and Student Success team. Um, so if you're, you, you kind of have to pay attention to both, pay attention to the questions that I'm asking, but then pay attention to the answered tab if you've also submitted a question. Um, all right, so rounding out the more presentation portion of the session, I'd like Kat to talk a little bit about academic advising, um, how it functions at USC, how many advisors do you have, how do you utilize them, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think somebody already mentioned before you are assigned an academic advisor based on the major that you are admitted to. Um, so if you could just elaborate on how that experience has been for you thus far. Yeah, so my experience has been really positive with advising. Um, so I have had the same advisor from the first schedule I ever made to now. And that kind of consistency is really nice because like my schedule and my majors and everything have been chaotic and she just understands and like knows how to help me with everything. Um, and so it's definitely nice to have that kind of consistency. And then I also have a second one for my NGOs major, because that one was for psych. And then I also um, have the two people who spearhead my minor as well to help me with that. So I have a lot of support all the time, um, and particularly my psychology advisor. Um, what's been really nice about meeting with her so consistently is that she's very knowledgeable about like what classes you should not take at the same time because maybe the workload would be too much or like she knows how to help me with the progressive degree application so even things that are outside of psychology advising per se she still knows uh, exactly how to help me or who to connect me with to help me. Um, so I've definitely always felt supported and always had consistency and even my NGOs may, uh, advisor did transition out and I got a new one, but even then I still felt like that person came in and wanted to learn my schedule and knew how to help me. So I've always been very supported and had a really positive um, experience with the process. Awesome. Um, and it's, you know, academic advising in terms of your majors and your minors or your double majors. Um, it's not limited to that. We do have academic advising for students who are um, pursuing pre-professional tracks, such as pre-law. That's usually one of the largest for students in the social sciences and humanities. So if you do intend on being pre-law at USC, it means that you can declare it on the common application or once you're here at USC and you are granted an additional pre-professional advisor who specializes in pre-law. Um, I know Gabrielle has some experience working with the pre-law office and like at least taking advantage of some of the opportunities that they that they put forth. Um, so Gabrielle, if you could go over that with us just, just a little bit, that would be great. And then we'll get into the Q&A. Yeah, of course. So I knew going into my undergrad education that I wouldn't apply directly after to go to law school. So for me, taking advantage of the pre-law advisement has really been gauging in terms of the application process when I do begin to sort of gear up with studying and seeing how you can be exposed to different law schools. Most recently, I went to an undergrad law fair where admissions ambassadors from law schools across the country came virtually to USC and we could chat with them, video call. And I think that's really valuable in that you can be as hands-on or hands-off as you please. If you wanna go directly into law school post-grad, they do have advising appointments where you can work substantially on building your portfolio, as opposed to me where I was gauging whether or not I'd go directly or not. So I scheduled an appointment with my advisor and discussed kind of where I was at academically and came to that conclusion um, with the help of the USC Gold Law School. And just to sort of stress the various ways in which they help you navigate, there is a period of time where I was considering the progressive degree program wherein students would get to spend three years at the Gold School of Law directly from their junior year at USC. And I went in, showed my materials, and after having a fairly honest and open conversation, came to the conclusion that it wasn't something that I wanted to pursue. So 
going into that, um, you know, whether you're sure or you're not sure, there's space to navigate that to your own comfort and to your own flexibility. And that's what I've really used it for, is for the remote resources, the in-person resources, and just sort of keeping up to date with all things sort of law school. Awesome. And I did see this like question float into the chat really um, in my peripheral. Um, so just because we are talking about academic advising, how often do you meet with your academic advisors? Anyone can answer. I can take that one. Um, as a freshman, I met with my academic advisor very consistently. You have the mandatory advisement appointments, which are, I think, really great because you don't really know how to learn the ropes um, in terms of getting on registering for all your classes, staying on your academic course. And slowly but surely, that foundation of that first USC year, I've been able to sort of experiment with, um, with different advisement appointments and kind of say, you know, at this point now, I know that two weeks from registration, I'm going to want to meet with my advisor. But that said, it's not mandatory it's to your own schedule and I've met with my advisor in my senior year I've met with my advisor twice now just to go over my course requirements and then my outgoing sort of requirements awesome um and the next question I'm just now I'm looking at some of the questions that are coming in um this one is actually for Kat what has been your greatest takeaway from the adolescent gain and intervention program and how did you get how did you decide to get involved with that program yeah absolutely so adolescent gang intervention is the social work 350 class and then the overall minor is social work and juvenile justice and that includes like three classes that are all in the realm of well social work and juvenile justice um and i think the biggest takeaway for me so far um is like I have just loved how hands on it is because like you would be surprised at just how many opportunities that are given through each of those classes. Um, right now I'm in the final class of the minor, which is called Community Experience and Juvenile Justice Environments. And my group in the class is actually partnered with uh, District Attorney Gascon's office to work on a project with them bringing restorative justice to the office, which is really, really cool. Um, and also uh, a guest speaker came to the adolescent gang intervention course when I took it um, for an organization called Neutral Ground, which is a gang intervention and prevention place in Santa Ana. And now I work with them consistently. I worked with them all summer um, and I've discovered that I really love that and would maybe like to go into that someday. And so I think given how hands on it is, like I've had so many opportunities to work with people who are really high up in this realm and just be super hands-on. So I think that's been the best takeaway of the whole thing. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, this question is actually for Jane. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to manage an internship during the school year? I know you had like, it was either research or internship, but like, how do you manage having an additional responsibility like research or internship during the school year? Yeah, so actually fall 2020 was an interesting time. I was home and I did both research and internship and a full load of classes. I won't recommend doing two and school all at the same time. I think um, choosing like either research or internship for me would have been better for like work-life balance personally, but I feel like it's very manageable. I've been lucky that the internships and the work positions I've been a part of aren't haven't been too demanding it's been mainly like 10 at most 20 hours a week and I feel like for me to manage my time properly I'll like start my week off you know charting what my responsibilities are at school what responsibilities I have for my internships and planning times where I can get that done I would say that for the most part, it hasn't been super, it hasn't been overwhelming at all to, you know, intern or do research add, and have a full load of classes. I think it's just a matter of like making sure that you plan and prioritize your time accordingly and just making sure that you're on top of your deadlines. My um, iCalendar is my lifesaver. It has everything and everything I need, but I don't think it's unmanageable at all. Awesome, thank you. Um, and this question is actually for Jack. So can, can you explain Jack um, or expand a little bit more on the, takeaway, on the takeaways from your program that focuses on your, your major 
um, that focuses on Spanish media and any other similar programs. Yeah, well, um, I felt like I was able to expand my knowledge far beyond just, um, you know, literature that you would read in any typical Spanish class. Not that there's anything wrong with literature. I like reading literature, too, but um, just uh, or learning about like uh, visual culture, such as like um, art or, you know, taking these film courses um, or was something that I'd never done before of like film analysis and then film analysis in another language. It's just like fascinating. And then also understanding the perspective that like um, Spanish and other European like um, film theorists and like Latin American film theorists think about these things is really interesting and like this intercultural dialogue that the major is really all about um, and that's just been um, it's had a huge impact on my own research and what I'm interested in like uh, Professor Blykmar that I've worked with on doing research she does work on like Mesoamerican codices um, that were produced like during the colonial period and doing color analysis on them. So something that I never thought that I would know anything about. And um, now I've watched like an entire podcast from like Oxford University about like color analysis and like Mesoamerican codices. So I think that it opens your perspective to something far beyond what you, you know, initially think of when you see the major. Awesome, thank you. Um, when we have maybe like two more questions. Um, so briefly for Jane, um, this is from a student who's applying from another state um, and you know, being from Hawaii and coming to USC, how was kind of the adjustment period? How did you feel like the school helped, uh, helped you um, acclimate to the new environment? Yeah, so being from Hawaii, LA somehow is like one of the closest major cities, but is also like 3000 miles away from home. So it definitely was an adjustment at first, just um, kind of like realizing that I'm in a new state. I like I called my parents a bunch when I first started off because I was like definitely adjusting. But I feel like USC really um, helped me, I guess, adjust to um, this new environment. I feel like the like living in a dorm my freshman year, I feel, felt like the um, resident assistance really helped by putting on events, fostering these, um, fostering these relationships between me and my neighbors. Um, also, I felt like joining clubs really helped. I actually was pre-law when I first came into USC, thought I was gonna go to law school post-grad and realized by joining a pre-law fraternity that um, that path was not for me. But through the clubs like the pre-law fraternity, also being in Hawaii clubs, so having that experience, sharing that experience with other people, I was able to create a close um, group of friends that I could rely on and, you know, hang out with, and it made USC feel a little smaller and a little bit more like home. So I think joining clubs and just taking advantage of all the social opportunities that are out there really helped me adjust. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our student speakers. And thank you all for joining us today and submitting such great questions. We will be sending you an email after this event with some helpful information and links, um, including a quick form that you can fill out if you'd like to correspond with a Dornsife student. And um, we actually have a colleague um, who's going to be putting some links into the chat. One of those is actually a platform where you can um, live chat with other Dornsife ambassadors. So we have a, a team um, of about 80 plus Dornsife ambassadors that are just like the students that you see here, majoring and minoring and double majoring and pursuing opportunities all across Dornsife and all across USC. So if you have a question pertaining to a particular topic, I might suggest um, looking there and trying to talk to a current student to get their perspective and their story. Um, so please stay in touch with us as you need to, especially if we weren't able to get to some of your questions today. I know it can be a little bit confusing about when to reach out to USC's main office of admission versus our admission office. Um, but if your questions fall under any of the topics we discussed today, it would be a great opportunity to engage further with our office. So thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you to you. Have a wonderful day and fight on. See you later.